Welcome first-time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. What about f***ing Colin? He was, he was in the news for a quick minute with the Raiders, and no one's talking about that shit still. Why the f*** not? Why does he not have a f***ing job? Because he's still being white-balled. Why is Tom not speaking out about that? He should be his biggest fucking ally. And he hasn't said one fucking thing. A lot of people that have come on this show, I don't know why, they've gotten some good fucking jobs afterwards. Jim Rome in the jungle. It's right here in the sports deli, baby. We got some good ass karma right here. Let's fucking go. I love <laughs> oh, man. it. I love it. We hope you enjoy today's show, everyone. And special thanks to Ruthie Bolton for that amazing rendition of You Are So Beautiful. All right, let's rock and roll. Along with former 10-year Major League Baseball star, who we'll name later, and Bob Nightingale from USA Today, we're so honored to welcome on Ruby Bridges' birthday, one of the most feared power hitters of his era, the big piece, Rhino Ryan Howard. And in case you forgot, Ruby Bridges was the first African-American child to desegregate in New Orleans in 1960. Ryan played Major League Baseball for 13 years, all with the Phillies. He was the fastest major leaguer to 100 home runs, 200 home runs, and 1,000 RBI. That's singular for those of you who still say RBIs. He was born the same day as Ted Turner, founder of CNN and former owner of the Atlanta Braves and the Atlanta Hawks. He was born the same year as Major League Baseball's Adrian Beltre and Luis Gonzalez, among others. His favorite team growing up were the St. Louis Cardinals. He had three all-star appearances and was the first national leaguer to win Rookie of the Year, and MVP in back-to-back seasons. And in 2008, he, along with his incredible teammates, won the ultimate team prize, the World Series. He's an author of numerous children's books, and there he is, ladies and gentlemen, just back from the gymnasium, former 10-year Major League Baseball (laughs) star and former Major League Baseball hitting coach. You guys are cracking up right now. That's awesome. For those of you listening and not watching on YouTube, he's an entrepreneur and investor. He worked for ESPN's Baseball Tonight. One of his rookie cards is currently going for nearly $400. He's a girl dad, a brother, and a husband. He has a fraternal twin. He's been on a number of shows, including Entourage and The Office. And you can find him on Instagram, among other places, at Ryan Howard underscore 006, not 007, but 006. Uh, first of all, before I, I let Jock and, and, and Bob uh, jump in, I have to tell you that Jackie Stiles, who also went to Missouri State, was supposed to be here also, uh, but she's so busy with uh, you know her new documentary that she couldn't be here, but she wanted to make sure that she sent her love to you. Oh, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. She was amazing. amazing. Yeah, she, she was amazing. She still is doing amazing things with kids in the, in the world of basketball. Welcome to the Sports Daily Podcast, where everyone deserves a seat at the table, especially all of you amazing men here today. Jack, what's up, man? Michael, Bob, what's up? Rhino. Hey, Jack. Young Jack, what's up, man? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I had to jump on this thing when he said he was interviewing you, man. I thought it would be good to catch up. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Always. Always, man. Looking good. Looking thank good. you, brother. You too, brother. Oh, thank you, man. Trying, man. These kids, I tell you. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love it. Right. We had it easier when we were playing, right? Now it's exactly. Exactly. All the time. It's like, man. <laughs> exactly. Get, back, get me back on the road. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they hey, just let anybody in here. Look at this. <laughs> what's up guys oh, Kenny Lofton in the Kenny? house ladies and gentlemen I love it oh, what's up man. Kenny what's up man oh my goodness oh man what's up Kay what's up Mr. Howard man <laughs> oh, man I see you everywhere out here golfing man and all these different <laughs> events and stuff no I'm not as good as uh the Jocko I mean you know Jocko come on man <laughs> <laughs> I love it I love it. Bob are, you, Bob, are you a golfer? No, I used to be. Not anymore. No time. No time. <laughs> <laughs> There's always time. It is always time. You got to squeeze it in, boy. I tell you That's that. Eight time. Yep. Even if it's just nine. Right. It's true. True. Howard, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see that golf game, right? Man, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, man. It's coming. It's coming. I'm you trying to work on this little draw. <laughs> this little almost, draw. <laughs> I know, I almost, almost hit. Who was it? I almost hit the very first time I played. Uh, I think it was like Milt. 
And I think it was like Milt, maybe like Michael Tucker or something like that. It was the first time in spring training we'd always have uh, like a team, like basically you'd have a short day of, of practice at spring training and then you'd leave and they'd do like a Phillies golf tournament. One of the owners was hosting. So I was with, uh, with uh, Bill Giles. He put me in his group. And so apparently he thought, cause I could hit home runs, I could hit a golf ball. <laughs> and so I had never played golf before and we were teeing off. And then there was like a green, like directly to the left of us. And so I hit it off the, the, the end of the, of the driver and <laughs> shot it down past the green where like Milty, I think Jimmy and his group were on the green and they just looked at me like crazy. And so I was like, yo, my bad. And got in the, got in the cart and Bill Giles looked at me. He said, Ryan, you are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've only ever played a couple times, man. This is this is it. So man. you got some bad intel on my golf game if that's why you chose me, though. Hey. But it was fun. It was fun. That is hilarious. <laughs> well, I know you guys uh, that jumped on are your time may be limited today. I know Kenny, you got some things going on. Bob yeah. uh, covering the season here down the stretch run, and uh, Jock, you definitely got some things going on. So if you guys have any questions before I, you know do my normal uh, sport deli menu of questions feel free to you know to ask uh, any questions obviously you guys know, know each other more intimately than I do uh, you know I'm just here to sort of create a safe space as you guys know and uh, talk about things from from my perspective and hear what you have to say and share it with the masses so if you guys have anything that you want to specifically know or chop it up about or roast any anybody about feel free to jump in <laughs> no, just, just a just a usual michael like ryan what are you up to these days what are you doing to keep yourself busy you know things like that man it's uh right now it's we've been in the middle of kind of doing this house renovation okay. uh like i said i mentioned before kind of chasing after these kids i got my, my oldest right now is in starting his senior year at lsu okay um and then i got three girls um that are about eight six and three so they're all off in school, which is allowing me the opportunity to be able to hop on here right now with nothing in the background. Um, <laughs> but I mean, but for the most part, it's been just kind of uh, hanging out a little bit, doing doing a little bit of the uh, the did a little bit of the uh, the baseball um, analyst work um, right now, just kind of trying to get the home front all settled in and, yeah. um, you know, kind of see where things take me from there, doing some investing here and there. But. Uh, for the most part, just kind of just laying low, trying to figure out this this golf game a little bit. Hey. Oh, Ken, Kenny, that light must have went out when he said a little investing over there. Oh man, <laughs> that's, hey, that's that's Mister Businessman right there. That's right. That's what it's, I mean, that's, that's it. what it's all about. You know, you just got to figure out what's your niche and figure out what that is, and you got to go from there. And that's we all have our little thing. And like I said, Jock know because he know he's hanging out with Tori all the time, and Tori is the man. You know, Tori is <laughs> is all over the place doing stuff. So yeah, you just got to yeah. figure out what your niche is and, and try to go for it. And let me ask you a question about that, you guys, because, you know, I grew up with the bad boys, right? Yeah. And, you know, people don't really know about angel investors and people that, you know, do a lot of things behind the scenes. And I heard about this a couple of years ago, but Vinnie Johnson, the microwave, former mm -hmm. Detroit Piston, he has a lot of money mm -hmm. and he got involved in some of the stuff that you guys are involved in that, that it, it I want to ask this thoughtfully. Is this something that the the black and brown community is getting into because that was a space that was wasn't tapped into? Um, what what's the reason for that kind of thing? Because I find it very interesting. There's a lot of people of color that are that are in this space right now, whether it's crypto so, or anything else. So yes. I I think let me jump in right right quick, Kenny, before you. I think um, as always, like we're always watching. Um, and listening and um, before guys you know would rest on their laurels make a lot of money and hey I, you know I don't need to work anymore I, you know I'm, I'm good but now guys are like looking at uh, the owners and 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 the, the CEOs and they have friends who are in other business ventures and they see what they're doing and they see like they got a lot of money but they're still working you know what I mean because they want to make more money <laughs> and sometimes yeah. it's not about the money. It's, it, when, like Kenny said, when you find your niche and you're doing something that you enjoy doing and you make money at it, I mean, 
why stop? And so I think like Kenny and, and myself and especially Tori, Tori was doing it while we were playing. And I'm like, dude, you got a gazillion dollars. Like, what are you doing? But he, he, he's like, he's, he was looking to transition into uh, uh, another space when he was done playing because he knew, and we all know it's, it's not forever. And so now even at a younger age, you look at these guys, like I look at a guy like Jash Shalom, right? He, he's got a, a bunch of followers on, on Instagram and all this stuff. And he's looking at, and he's looking to do things outside of baseball. He's starting now. And so mm -hmm. guys are starting to start at the beginning of their careers in the middle of their careers, as, as opposed to us, where we kind of started like late. For me, I'm always going to say this. I don't want our, our people to come and say they didn't have an opportunity. So I just feel like I'm I'm the person or one of the people who want to start something to give them an opportunity because that necessarily they wouldn't have. So now I have that opportunity to start something and do something to bring them along to show them, hey, this is how you can get involved. As long as you put the work in, things can work out. And myself and, and Tori, we talked about that a lot of times is that, you know, we want to give them an opportunity that they wouldn't have. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both. Um, and kind of piggybacking a little bit off of off of Kenny, it's it's about you know the same thing, right? Where when I came into the big leagues, I got Jock, I got Kenny, and you know they're they're paving the way, right? You're trying to show and pave the way and say, hey, we're the guys that can come before you. Like Kenny said, it's kind of opening up those doors, providing those opportunities, but showing you there's other opportunities outside of what you're doing so it's like i think in this day and age a lot of it is to where playing baseball or whatever it is that's your initial platform to help kind of set stuff off i mean like if you look at a jay-z or you look at a drake they started off as rappers kanye they start their their first platform was rapping and making music now they are business moguls you know what I mean? So it's using those those different platforms that you can diff that you can have to be able to take it to the next level, which, yeah, like going back hindsight 2020, because we didn't have Instagram and all the social media type stuff and didn't, you know, know about all that. Now, I don't know how many people would have really wanted it back then, but still, you know, to have it today to where these guys are able to monetize off that while they're playing and still get a different look and say, hey. I can set myself up to where I can make this baseball money now, but like I'm trying to make this owner money like my post baseball career by setting themselves up to do different things while they're still playing the game. So I think it's, it's having more opportunities um, and, uh, and bigger platforms to be able to do that at this day and age. But, you know, real quick, so just to say, because you want, I always tell these guys, like I, I talk to Jack Flaherty all the time. I say, you guys need to make a name for yourself in baseball yeah. first. And then you slowly branch off. It's like mm -hmm. a tree. It'll, it'll, it'll all fall into place. Like, it's yeah. like I said, it's like with Jay-Z and, and Drake and those guys, like they mastered their craft first and foremost that helped to open up doors to other avenues of business and success, which is exactly what Kenny's saying is hey you got to get your name you got to get your you got to get your game right because like i said that is your initial jump off platform that can help jump off everything else post you know post baseball because that window even if you play for 20 years that window of life is so small to where if you started at 19 20 and you ended by the time you were 40 you know god willing you still got 60 years left of life so you still, the, the goal is, is like, everybody want to still make baseball money, even though they're not playing baseball. <laughs> so that's, that's, <laughs> Hey, that's, that's, that's the truth. So, I mean, it, it is what it is, but I think to what, you know, we're saying is you have to master that first platform to be able to kind of help set everything off. And then that's at this point is for these guys, it is mastering their craft at baseball. I have a question, but I want to see if Bob wants to jump in about uh, anything related to this or anything else before I ask my question. I was just going to say it is tougher to get the you know, marketing endorsements in baseball than the other sports. It, it really is. I mean, Otani, you know, he's, he's making killing off the field, you know, by twice as much as Derek Jeter ever made. Uh, so that's rough. But, yeah, you might as well monetize what's going on. I mean, baseball is going to have uh, decals and uh, advertisements on their uniforms next year. 
that's going to, you know, bring in a ton of money, you know, why not take advantage of that? But, you know, back, back in the day when I, when I was covering Bo Jackson, you know, he didn't want to go back to NFL or, or even start to NFL, but Nike made it impossible to turn down. Like Nike says, Hey, we don't really care about the baseball. Now if you go to football, uh, we're going to give you a lot of money endorsement wise. So baseball has got it rougher than the other sports. So this is a question I wanted to ask. I appreciate those uh, sentiments and, and that insight. Uh, Cause I never even thought about Bo Jackson with regards to what you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> I, I think because of this podcast, one of the things that's, I guess, pissed me off to be quite honest with you is when like uh, Jelani McCoy or I've had conversation with Jocelyn Rose, who's the director of the uh, documentary Stand about Mahmoud Abdul Rauf that's going to be coming out uh, early next year, and others who have come on the show to talk about the black dollar and um, <clears throat> how things have been suppressed for de- decades, but even until recently, and the power of the black dollar. And the thing that I thought about when you guys were talking about this, you talk about leveraging your platform. And we talk about that a lot. Is this something in a way, because whites in the entertainment industry and in other uh, industries like sports uh, have basically done everything they can, even if the black dollar would make them more money, suppressed those situations because they didn't want to give up control. So that's the point that I was trying to make. But do you think now there's been a shift where you can leverage things differently, even to the point where we might make inroads in uh, ownership situations um, in various sports uh, because of how uh, the black dollar is impacting things? I, I think you'll see it in, well, you, we've already seen it in basketball, uh, Michael Jordan, you know what I mean? Um, I think you'll see it maybe in football. Uh, I do not know that you'll see it in baseball, although Dave Stewart um, is is heading a group uh, in Nashville uh, to get uh, the Nashville Stars um, um, into existence there in Nashville. Um, but it's just, I mean, I feel like that's the last sport that they have to hold on to um, um, in that network. You know what I mean? Where it's just like it, it's going to be, it's going to be really, really tough. But I, I think uh, football and basketball, just because there's more African American. Uh, uh, players and then more African Americans in positions of authority. Um, like you got, you know, you got general managers and you got presidents and, and, and things like that. But baseball is going to be tough. Uh, and, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but I feel like baseball is going to be one of the toughest sports. Derek Jeter, Magic Johnson, you know, got 5% of their teams, but hardly the majority. Yeah. I believe it was a guy like Kenny Williams, if the White Sox ever came for sale, he would have enough investors and people on the side where he could get it done and become a majority owner. Well, like, like he yeah. said, it's, it's tough. I mean, I mean, we all know it's tough. It's been that way for years. And for it to break that barrier, <clears throat> that type of barrier in baseball, it's, it's going to be very tough because, again, you have um, people want to, to keep that hold of something that they can keep a hold of and they're not going to let it go. But – I mean, we have to, we have to slowly make strides like we've done in every other thing we've done. We just gotta keep pushing forward and hopefully something to turn. And like you said, what what Stu is trying to do out there in Nashville, what they're trying to do, and hopefully that can be one of the um, the the avenues that 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 can be taken to to start that process. I mean, him and Lonnie got pushed back in Oakland too. I mean, and Dave was on the show, so yeah. you know, I I just wonder if it's for for other reasons, you know, fill in the blanks. But, but things are cyclical, Ryan. Do you think uh, we'll ever see the, the type of involve, um, involvement from people of color in baseball in terms of uh, playing? Because I don't know if it was Bob or somebody else mentioned <clears throat> a big problem is scholarships in college. Mm-hmm. There's such a low level number of scholarships in, in intercollegiately mm-hmm. that you're not going to attract uh, people of color, uh, especially in, in baseball, you know, which is not the primary sport in America to yeah. play if there's no scholarships, no college opportunities, and right. they're not going to be making a lot of money out of, you know, getting drafted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a tough, tough situation. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a tough sport. I mean, it's even still, I mean, I think kind of going all the way back to kind of the, 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 the showcase, 
days. Like baseball right now, it's, it seems as though it's very, very expensive. Everything is about showcases. Everything's about travel ball. Um, you know, you got to pay X amount to be on the team. And then you got to pay for, you know, try to pay for lessons. And then you got to pay to go, you know, away to the tournaments and whatnot. So, I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, it seems to be that, you know, with the showcase games right now, it's like it's a lot more expensive to to try to get uh, try to get more black kids and kids of color to be able to play the game. Now, not only that, um, I think it's also, too, about coaching. It's, it's about having access to people who actually know what the hell they're talking about. Like, I mean, you, you, you can, you can do different programs or, or whatnot, but it's like, let's be honest. It's like, depending upon where you're from, um, you can have the talent, all the talent in the world, but you need that coach or that person to help kind of mold that talent where, you know, let's just be real. Like a lot of your, your, your white counterparts are going to have that access because they have you know, the abilities or, or, or the parents may have the funds to be able to send them to get lessons and go to these places and this and that where you may not. So it's like your level, your level of competition is also going to be off. I had a situation actually where my brother, my older brother took my nephew, they live in Indianapolis and he called me. He's like, Hey, you know, um, your nephew wants to play in the RBI league, right? Cause he wants to play with kids that look like him. I'm like, Oh, cool go for it. And he calls me back and he says, Hey, it seems as though the, uh, these guys are all over the place and it's very unorganized. I said, that's because it is. I said, because you don't live in a city that has a major league team, because when you're in a city that has a major league team, that RBI program is reflective of their organization at that point. Like in, in Indy, all you got, you got the triple A squad. So, you know, it, it, it is what it is in that sense where, hey, you're, you're trying to do something right, but it's, again, you've got to have the right people in there to help shape and mold and grow these players' games to help them to be able to get to the next level. I mean, I think from what you're saying, and I think Major League Baseball has a, a, the big problem with that, and the reason why is because they spend so much money on these other places like – Dominican and all those other places where they spend all that money out there to to help grow those kids and I mean nothing against it if you want to do that that's fine but you can also do something in your own well homegrown areas you know we yeah. got all these places out here if you say when you use the word you know RBI reviving baseball in the inner city they should take a hold to that and put that right next to their side and be a part of them like it's no other but they're not doing that. They're just throwing the through darts over there here and right. there to say, oh, okay, we did something. No, do it the right way. You have all of these ex-Major League Baseball players in all these cities all there around you. There have you. an opportunity to be a part of that. There you they go. don't want to let people like us be a part of it because, there again, you. what? I don't know what it is. They have all this money. There you go. I talked these, about it earlier. That's the point I was trying to make earlier is they don't want to give up the control and the perception. You got all these ex major leaguers looking for something mm -hmm. just to go. do because they're out there. There give you go. Them a couple thousand dollars here and there and let them work with these Great. kids. Let well, them get some yeah. real training for the real kids out there that say, hey, these guys have been there, done that. They can teach you the right way. These I, kids I don't get that. This is this is what this is what I think, and Bob, maybe you can uh, tell me if I'm going in the wrong direction because you're in that circle on the other side. You know, you you you've been in situations where you've been able to talk to owners and and presidents and all. You know, for me personally, and Kenny can speak to it as, as well. We went to college. Okay, Kenny went, uh, I believe, on a basketball scholarship. Okay. Um, Basketball pretty much is a full ride. Baseball, you got 11.7 scholarships to divide between 25, 30 guys. I was lucky in that I went to Southern Cal. I got a full ride. My mother would not have even, she, she would have been in so much debt trying to say, and, and quite frankly, I wouldn't have, she wouldn't have even had to go in debt because she couldn't afford to send me there. Okay. My thing is we need in each major city that we have a team, an RBI facility program. 
okay? They, there needs to be, uh, uh, I don't know how it's gonna get funded, maybe Major League Baseball could step in, 25 scholarships per baseball program. You know what I'm saying? So that way, kids like me and kids like Ryan and kids like Kenny, you know what I'm saying? Can, can uh, uh, have an opportunity to play college base because like I was under the impression that black kids aren't playing baseball but you know having access to, to Instagram and, and Facebook and all mm -hmm. these other social media outlets they are playing baseball <laughs> you got the mm -hmm. Hank Aaron you got the minority baseball program you got the uh, uh, what is that the breakthrough series and you know there's a few other pro I mean they are playing baseball but to get to the next level and, and have an opportunity to play that's where the disconnect is Mm -hmm. I think Major League Baseball should fund the uh, extra scholarships, Jack. It's like you said, just 11.7, get up to 25, because it's going to get worse. We we're talking to Tony Clark uh, a couple months ago. He says with those new, you know, the NILs now, mm -hmm. hey, if you're uh, get a chance to make big, big money playing college football or basketball, mm -hmm. why in the world would you go play baseball? Yep. You know, it's like the Kyler Murray situation. I mean, are you kidding me? You know, Baseball had no chance once he won that Heisman. Why, right. you know, why go to baseball? Right. Yeah. Like you said, that name, image, and likeness. That's gonna go. It's gonna go. It's it's big. It's bigger yeah. than what it was. What it was. But the thing about it is, if you think about that, it's only gonna be the top tier. People don't. Mm -hmm. People don't get that. You can just right. say you can have a college team with, 20, just say twenty five players. Only one, maybe two of those guys, that's going to be able to take advantage of their NIL, because again. They're only going to take the top tier and also in other sports. Look at other mm -hmm. sports. So it's only going to be maybe football and basketball where you're really going to be able to take advantage of that NIL. And that's the problem in all those other sports, swimming, you know, all those other sports where these are some great athletes, they won't be to take advantage of that. Because again, mm -hmm. the corporations, the corporate people putting their dollars on the top names. They're going to spend the, the money on the top football player that come out of Florida State or come out of Florida or whatever, or, 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 or USC. You're going to have that top two or three, two guys that's going to get the NIL, you know, money. But the rest of them, nothing. So it's not like it's an overall perspective. They say, oh, yeah, college players are making money. No, they have an opportunity, no. but only that select few will get the money those other guys, they don't. They, they still ain't making money. Yeah, but 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 also, Kenny, I think uh, uh, to speak to what you were saying with the NIL, um, I think baseball has a chance. College baseball, because now it's on ESPN two, it's on ESPN, it's on, I mean, regular season games, and then they're they're showing all the play in like the playoffs and the uh, super regionals and things like that. And then I think with this last draft, I think like with guys like Andrew Jones' son. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like guys like that, guys who are pretty visible, but again, yeah. on the social media side of things. Like right. I think once guys like that start getting deals here and there, then I think that'll open the door for other people to 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 get deals, especially in college baseball. We hope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's gonna be it's that I think that's gonna be very interesting to to, to see. Um, like you said, because like with with Andrew's son or or guys who played before and their sons who are somewhat in that in that light right um, yeah i think they're going to have that access i think it's still going to be i think it's still going to be tough right like baseball wise yeah especially in college like for guys to be able to get that because you get the instant gratification from football and basketball you go straight from college straight to the league right. like from high from 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 college or high school baseball you go straight into them bushes man yeah. <laughs> you go you go yeah. into the jungle man the minor leagues yeah so you know it's again your name and your notoriety like to where uh, uh, uh just for the example like andrew's son to where let's i mean lord willing no no injuries all that kind of stuff like he's the, the dna kicks in he does what his pops does he's gonna be in the show right right but we don't know necessarily that about you know some of these other kids to where we've all seen some first rounders that you know were very high picks or whatever that got in the bushes and they couldn't find them way out. Right. And they and, and they got swallowed up. So it's it's always a very, very interesting thing to kind of see how it will play 
for for baseball and i think just because like with the minor leagues the minor leagues can can chew you up and spit you out i've, I've never seen but i can only i've only know heard and all that kind of stuff in terms of what you mentioned before kenny the the academies right in dominican and venezuela and all that kind of stuff and it's like it's why can't you create those same type of academies in your own backyard here in the states so to where it's like okay you've you've got the coaches you've got the people you have the facilities to where again you take this kid you can develop their raw talent and get them going in the right direction to where they can be seen like i'm in georgia and one of the biggest places right up the street up 75 here is Lake Point. And they do all these, you know, these, these baseball tournaments and showcases where when my son was going through it, like we're out there. There's for his age group, there's 100, 200 teams there playing for the week. So you got college coaches, you got MLB scouts, you got everybody of everybody coming down to one spot to come watch all these kids play. And it's like you said, it's all about having that access, like to 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 be seen and be in the right situation. Let me ask a, a, a question. I'm going to give you a few menu items, Ryan, and uh, pivot a little bit here. And you let me I know. Have, what you... I have to go anyway, so. But I got to. Yeah, you're good, Ken. I appreciate but you, man. It was good, man. Good talking, Much love, guys. Brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> Please. We'll catch up soon, man. Yeah. All right. Hey, Kenny would have got Kenny would have got that nil deal. <laughs> oh hell yeah, that <laughs> five tool player. He definitely would have got That's that. It, deal. All right, man. <laughs> all right, okay. 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 All over social media. Okay, so uh, do you want to talk about music, mental health, uh, your upbringing in Missouri, or Major League Baseball leadership? Hmm. Um. Let's start off with music first. Okay, so we've had a lot of people come on here uh, from Jahidi White, uh, former Georgetown Hoya NBA player. Yeah, and he, St. He, he Louis probably, guy. Yeah, that's right. And so he he said it best, I think. You know, uh, he couldn't go anywhere, but music allowed him to travel the world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, talk about that because really the trends in society, um, you know, fashion-wise, music-wise, and, and, and a lot of other areas are because of uh, people of color hip hop, uh, fashion. So what, what was it like for you growing up in the Midwest? Oh man. Um, I would always say like, I loved, loved growing up where I grew up St. Louis, um, because we were smack dab, basically smack dab in the middle. So yep. we had the best of both worlds. We had East coast music. We had the West coast music. <laughs> then the down South came, you know, the dirty <laughs> South came. So we got, we got a little bit of everything. And then Nelly came, you know, coming oh, from out of St. Louis, which actually there was a funny, funny Nelly story. Uh, they used to have these camps. Uh, the the major league teams would throw these little kind of like workout tryout camps. And so myself, my boy Reggie and, and Nelly were all at this. It was the Braves for the Braves, actually. And we were all at this camp and we were all trying out and working out together and doing all that. And it was like we were only three black kids there and we made it all the way through to the very end. And, you know, we were just talking to him. He told us who he was. He was like, yeah, man, I'm just trying to give this baseball thing one more go before I start doing this rap stuff. And so fast forward a couple of years, Country Grammar comes out. My boy Reggie hits me up. He's like, do you remember that dude? That was him. So like, wow. you know, it, like Nelly was, Nelly was an athlete. I mean, probably still is an athlete. I mean, dude is still put together. But, <laughs> but I mean, in terms of that, I mean, it's just like for, I think like, to what you had mentioned with like Jahidi White, like music can transcend. It can, you can be sitting in your room, but it can take you to so many different places. Like, even though I had never been to New York, if I'm listening to some type of like New York East Coast type rap or whatnot, like I'm getting, getting the visuals and getting that feeling where it can take you to just those different places. Um, and just, you know, transcend just whatever it is that you're feeling that day you know whether it's something hardcore or whether it's something you know soft or mellow or just whatever it is um you know music music is that thing it's that it's that soother so it's like because i would kind of go about picking my 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 walkout songs you know what i mean it was <laughs> like how you go about picking your walkout songs man it's like there's there's always little things behind all that stuff man so Whatever it is that kind of gets you in the groove and gets you feeling feeling right. Bob, what's your walkout song? <laughs> <laughs> I'd 
be an earth, wind, and fire guy, so I, I wouldn't go either devotion or reasons. <laughs> I love <laughs> One it. One of those two. <laughs> when Bob getting ready to write, he reads. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Man, that's phenomenal. Uh, Jock, anything in that in that area in terms of music? San Diego, you West Coast guy. Yeah, you know, um, I kind of even even though I'm on the left coast, I'm kind of like Ryan, where I kind of I wasn't. And when I grew up, it was kind of like the East Coast West Coast, you know, war. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So guys are like, ah, I'm not listening to the East Coast because I'm mm -hmm. on the West Coast, and I'm not listening to West Coast because I'm on. But I'm like, dude, if you got good beats and you like, I was in the beats, and then I started getting into lyrics. <laughs> Right. So you got good beats and you got good lyrics. I don't give a damn where you're from. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like right now, my favorite rapper is Little Baby. Like I love I'm all Little Baby all day, every day. You know what I'm saying? But because I like what he's saying, I like how he, pre he presents himself. He doesn't get in all this mess that his friends are getting into and people around him. Mm -hmm. He's about little baby, about making good music and making money and taking care of his family. And and he tells you throughout all his raps. Mm -hmm. So it's like you know what's going on in each sector of the the country just by listening to the music. They'll tell you mm -hmm. what's going on in their neighborhood. They'll tell you who's doing what and who's saying what. So it's like like you said, it, it's like reading the newspaper. I can, mm -hmm. I can, I can find out what's going on in the East Coast just by listening to music and, and not have to go to the East Coast or not want to go to the East Coast because of what's going on. You know what I'm saying? So Jahi was right. I mean, you can travel the world and not leave your living room. That's amazing. Yeah, it was like that for me too. I mean, it was Run DMC, right? Fat Boys, mm -hmm. uh, you know, KRS-One. I mean, a lot Fat of old boys. Man, <laughs> I mean, they were they were a trip, man. They they, they, mean, were. they, they were fun. Yeah. Um, Ryan, your your teammate uh, Jimmy Rollins. This is a couple of years ago, but I always refer to this because I thought it was really interesting because there's a couple of nuances that I noticed that maybe other people didn't notice or talk about. <clears throat> and he was on Race and Sports in America on the Golf Channel, along with uh, Chuck, uh, Steph Curry, and and a few others. And one of the things that I've uh, mentioned before that I noticed was, and this was after George Floyd, so just to put it in perspective, Steph Curry in particular, we know how layered he is. He doesn't want to just be remembered as the greatest, you know, shooter in the history of the game. You know, he's interviewed Obama. He's got his book club. You know, he's helped HBCs. You know, there's a lot to this guy. And, <clears throat> but I noticed his body language when, they were discussing specific topics and this is a, this is a big part of our show. You know, me trying to be an ally, mobilize, uh, educate, uh, people. I've had a lot of pushback. The vitriol that I get on YouTube is, I mean, I can't even imagine being a person of color. Like some of the stuff is just brutal. Um, <clears throat> and it's fine. I got thick skin. I'm not worried about it. Uh, as long as they don't threaten my family and things like that. And they cross the line, but <clears throat> You know, what, what, what are your guys' thoughts about where we are two years after the fact, whether it's in sports and, and, you know, I've been very critical of the NFL when Jim Trotter was on, you know, he was very transparent. He's been very outspoken to the commissioner uh, and in his interviews, Major League Baseball obviously is uh, way behind. That's why I asked about leadership. So I just wondered, you know, your opinion about that, uh, you know, and this was another interesting sort of twist that I didn't know about. And um, Bob, I hope you're okay with me talking about it, but you know, I didn't find out until halfway through the interview that Bob's wife is a person of color. She's black. And so, you know, that threw me that I had to pause for a second and, you know, he explained to me about how they had to move when they were younger from an apartment. I think it was down in Florida uh, because the people at the apartment complex wouldn't let his kids swim in the pool. This isn't that long ago. And so I don't think that we can continue to talk about things without shedding light on issues that still exist today. A lot of it is on you, you know, YouTube and TikTok, where we see police officers, you know, overstepping their authority and things of that nature. But you know, whether it's in sport or in society, you know, when I talk about the things that I just shared with you, or anything come to mind? You guys want to speak on that? You know, where we are and how we can mobilize and and be a better version of, of ourselves, especially in the white space as allies. I mean, like my, my, my wife is white, so right. I have mixed kids. So right. I mean, it's, 
And so I'm sure, you know, it was a learning curve for my wife, you know, because it was it was a lot of stuff that she either wasn't exposed to or didn't really. It was like one of those things where it's like you either you hear the stuff, but you don't experience the stuff and people don't understand like what it is or, or, or how you're going through something until it actually affects you. Mm hmm. And that's the, that's the thing. It's like, oh, what? they're always complaining. It's this, it's that. It's like, because it, it, it doesn't have a direct effect on those people. Mm -hmm. And it, it's until, until or unless it has a direct effect, you can never understand it. So you'll always look at something, you know, the, the way you'll see it until you, you have an effect, like it's, you know, it's uh, like if you're if if your kids you know lord forbid like all this stuff that we've got going on right now with like school shootings and stuff you know like with politicians who, and all that kind of stuff not to really get all into the, the politics of it all but it's like you got people that won't either ban this or, or or say hey we need to do that it doesn't change until it's their kid that's at that school right. that a shooter was at or it doesn't affect them until it's their kid that's being made fun of. So I just, I mean, it's, it, but it's just like I've always said with stuff like this, it's like people have to want change and you can't make somebody change that doesn't want change. So until people, there's certain people that are ready or wanting change, it's gonna be very, very hard. I mean, and for those that do, like we welcome that. Because it should be, you know, and everybody love everybody, as I quote Jackie Moon from Semi Pro, like it, it, everybody love everybody type situation. Because it's, in in my opinion, it's like, dude, it's 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 not that necessary. It's not. Um, it, it's it it is tough because we've all gone through different things. I know, Jock, you've gone through some stuff just just cause. Just cause got pulled over just cause, oh, the car was the car you're driving or the windows were tinted or, or whatever, just cause, well, what did I do? Well, I just pulled you over cause your windows are too dark or like I ran your plate and nothing came back. Like, what's the point of you running my plate because of the car that I'm in, because there's wheels on the car, because the windows are tinted. Like why, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, a, it's, it's a, always a, a tough situation, but I mean, the way it's I a, it's, it's like, a white issue though, isn't it? And this is, sort I mean, of the, it's, this is, this, this is part of the reason why I, I, I shared with Bob at the end, sort of tongue in cheek that I thought he mm -hmm. should write a book, not necessarily about baseball, but about his family experience and what people in the white space might learn from this. It's not up to blacks to teach white people about the history of this country. I think it is. I think it is, Michael. Uh, Michael. I think it's 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 part of our. Haven't you done enough, though? Yeah, but but yeah. it's still it, it's it's still a, a communication thing, right? I think it's up to us to educate, but it's also up to whites to also educate themselves and be willing to be educated, right? Um, I think I think like my first bout of racism and i don't know if you i think you've heard the story bob um when i was at southern cal went over to lsu and i won't even get into the story but that was the first time i was called an n-word playing baseball <laughs> doing something that i love to do was called the n-word right because i was i was having success against their team being being from the west coast were were and especially san diego's a melting pot Okay, so I didn't know to hate white people. I didn't know to hate Mexicans. I didn't know to hate because I grew up around all of them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, then, then you know, going to SC, uh, uh, a PWI, right? I didn't know that like these people were, my teammates' parents took me in as a young black player from, or student athlete from Southeast San Diego. They took me in to their homes in the San Fernando Valley. Hey, you could spend the night here anytime, right? They didn't see black, white. They just saw a good person, right? It, even to this day, right? And I'll, I'll fast forward a little bit. Uh, 
once I was a first black member of my country club. Okay. Uh, there was a little bit of standoff ishness, but now I'm like the mayor at my country club. <laughs> but it's just being around people, it's being around and getting to know them. And I changed some opinions about how people feel about black people. So it is some education still by us, but it's also being receptive mm -hmm. to being educated. You understand what I'm saying? And and with the with the the police and the brutality issues, it's been happening. Now it's just getting caught on yeah. tape now. And mm -hmm. white people are starting to acknowledge that it's actually happening and we're not making it up. You know what I'm saying? Right. But you still have those people that'll look at the tape and say, uh, what, did what happened do? didn't happen. Right. Right. Well, what right. what did he do to deserve right. that? Right. right. Comply. You know I mean? that, that, exactly. When, that the thing that burns my ass, Michael, is when I hear you did not comply. So whatever happens to you deserves to happen to you because you didn't comply. That burns my ass. That word. But what do you? But what do you do when you do comply? And that's what or I'm. When, or or if you're not given the chance to comply. And, and Ryan, that's why it burns me up because yeah. I've seen tapes where people have complied and they still right. got whatever right. it was that they got even a couple of weeks ago remember with the duke uh, volleyball player yeah when she, was right. at BYU, she told, tells a story it's everywhere now all of a sudden all these groups come out oh she made this stuff up they right. don't want to believe it right right yeah yeah it's uh it's it's uh definitely something i guess you know you have to have it on both sides but uh, i just feel like we have a greater responsibility and this is why i've been so critical not necessarily major league baseball but if the nfl and I have ranted about the white quarterbacks mm -hmm. and their lack of involvement. It You talk about burning your ass, <laughs> man. Uh, I don't understand. Forget the MAGA hat. We, Bob and I talked about this, you know, Tom Brady having the MAGA hat in his locker. Wow, we should feel so badly about Tom and his marriage right now. Yo, <laughs> hey, Tom, I've looked at every one of your posts in the last two plus years on Instagram and Twitter. You know how many times you've said Black Lives Matter or been outspoken about anything going on that's an injustice or that has to do with systemic racism? None. You know, and Aaron Rodgers, not far behind. And Ben Roethlisberger and Peyton and Eli and all these guys and Tony Romo and Troy Aikman and Matthew Stafford. You know, it's about being a public ally, not being on a coalition behind closed doors or just saying something once in a while like – you talk about leveraging your platform. Like, where are these guys? Like, how hard is it to be an ally about something, especially things that wouldn't even be risque? Right. Some things are a little risque. I get it. But most of the stuff is not. Why aren't you speaking out against it? You know, and the NFL with their lip service, you know, and Major League Baseball has got different issues. But football, especially, you guys are football fans, right? Like, you understand this stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it's just back to business as usual. And I just can't for the life of me understand it. Like <laughs> Andre Risen pushed back a little bit and said, well, Tom's made these guys a lot of money and this and that. I'm like, Andre, come on, man. Like they don't have to say one thing, but wh why aren't they saying anything, man? Like I don't, I don't get it. And why aren't their people in their circle pushing back and saying, you got to do more in this space? Because it doesn't affect them. <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect their day to day. No. But, but. And that's, I mean, I, and, and, and like, don't get me wrong. Cause I'm like, I'm a Brady fan. Like I love, you know, all those guys. I love watching those guys and I think they're great talents, but it's like, again, it's like I said, it's like, it doesn't have an effect on their day to day. Like it, it, everybody, everybody's different in that aspect. It, 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 it is Ryan. And, and you're right to a certain extent. It doesn't affect their day. But I mean, when you look across the locker room, what do you oh, see? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's where I mean, he may, they, that's why I say like, everybody's different. He may yeah. go over to his teammates and say, Hey bro, like I got your back. And, but you know, him posting it, I, yeah. that's, you, he, you, obviously you have your reasons for, for yeah. why you, why, why you do and why you don't like at the end of the day, man, it's just about, are you a good person? Right. Like is, I, I haven't met Tom Brady. I would, I would like to assume he's a good person. I would like to assume that you know the the Mannings are 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 good good people, you know. So it's like I'm not gonna sit here and and judge them or say whatever because they're not using that platform. Can they use their platform? Absolutely. 
Should they? Yeah, sure. Why not? Everybody, they, they have their reasonings for why I guess they, they do or don't do what they, what they want. And I mean, I guess to like Andre Risen's thing is like, well, Tom Brady's made them a lot of money, but they've also made Tom Brady a lot of money. Right. So it goes, it goes right. both ways because he can throw the ball. If they don't catch it, right. they're not going where they're going. Well, a lot of guys too, you just don't want that pushback. I mean, you saw the, yeah. uh, the Jeter documentary, you know, you saw Michael Jordan, that sort of thing. Never spoke out, never wanted that kind of pushback. Uh, you know, the guys I covered, the only guy I can really remember that was really spoke his mind was Gary Sheffield. And he bounced around everywhere because people thought mm -hmm. he'd be a problem just because he spoke his mind. It's bullshit to me. I don't give a shit what the reason is. It's just fucking bullshit. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. The fact, all those guys, I mean, there's not one white quarterback with influence that says anything like consistently at all. Like, how is that possible? Like, I know we're talking about baseball today in part, but like, how is that possible? I mean, there's 10, the top 10 white quarterbacks include Ben who just retired. They don't say anything. That's not what anybody talks about, but we're talking about Tom retiring on the first day of black history month that tom like it's so tone deaf i can't guys and then you want to post all these fucking videos about your brand which you got money for you got investors for and you don't have to go through the normal process that people of color have to go through to raise funds for your business because of your white privilege and you want to complain about how life is tough man f get the fuck out of here with that bullshit that is some straight up bullshit i'm sorry you know, I, I'm a life coach. I care about people. I'm sorry you're having a tough time with your wife. Fuck the dumb shit, man. That is just some ignorant ass shit. You know, and no, no one pushes back. No reporters will sit in his pressers and fucking push back on this shit because we're two years removed. What about fucking Colin? He was, he was in the news for a quick minute with the Raiders and no one's talking about that shit still. Why the fuck not? Why does he not have a fucking job? Because he's still being white balled. Why is Tom not speaking out about that? He should be his biggest fucking ally. And he hasn't said one fucking thing. But my man, Deshaun Watson, has got 30 allegations against him, against women, and has the richest, biggest contract with the most guaranteed money of any quarterback in the history of the game. And no one's saying anything about that. It is fucking unbelievable. Fuck that. Like, what would it take? Like, we're all dads. Like, we all get it. But how does he not get it? Like, what would it take for one of his kids to come up and say, hey, Daddy, who's Colin Kaepernick? And then he explains it. And then they go, well, how come you haven't done anything to stand up for this guy? Well, it's complicated. See, that's the thing. It's not complicated. You've been in locker rooms for how long? And you don't get it still? You're worried more about your image? Man, come on. It's so ridiculous. Like, here's a scenario for you. One of his kids is dating someone of color. They're out on a date night and they get pulled over. And what do you think happens? They harass the kids, have no idea that it's Tom's kid. And then the body cam comes out later. And now all of a sudden, Tom's going to be this huge ally. Like, that's what it would take for you to wake up and to understand the magnitude of your silence and how deafening it is. It's unbelievable, man. All right, let's transition to mental health. <laughs> <laughs> man. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry about that, Ram fellas. <laughs> I just got to go off sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> well, you guys certainly are in a great space with mental health. But, you know, we just saw Carmela Anthony. Uh, speak about this, you know, and, and, uh, you know, other guys have come out in various sports, you know, Lonnie um, Murray, who's Dave Stewart's wife is a good friend of mine now because of this show and Dave coming on the show. And, you know, one of her clients, uh, you know, Ryan has gone through a lot of mental health stuff, but you guys talk about, especially from, from the transitioning out of, out of what you've done your whole life uh, or generational trauma. Um, you know, things that are not necessarily talked about in the black and brown community uh, because of stigmas or getting roasted, those types of things. You know, wh where do you guys want to go with that? Because I think it's important that we shed a light on that uh, and more people of color talk about it and normalize it. Um, 
mental health for me is huge. And like, like you, Michael, I got certified to be a life coach. Um, I don't even really like to deal with baseball per se, right? Yeah. I, my, my friends will send me videos. My friends will, you know, hey, can you help this person? Like, I'll do that all day long, man. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's, you know, what is their mindset? How are they mentally? What's going on in their life? Um, you know, I, I have five friends of mine and we're tight to this day. And Ryan, you know them all, Eddie Guardado, Matt Lawton, Tory Hunter, Latroy Hawkins. Uh, um, we had a couple other guys you might not know of, Ben Jones. He he's uh with the the Reds uh in the in a uh like not a front office position. But anyway, we have a group text and we hold each other accountable for parenting. You know, uh, some guys are still married. So, you know, we talk about family and, and and things like that. But my thing is, like, growing up in a in Southeast San Diego, again, growing up in Southeast San Diego as a Black male, right? Oh, you got to be tough and 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 don't, you know, don't succumb to the pressure and and, and don't show emotion and, and, and deal with everything like a, a man, right? But to me, a man can can tell you his emotions. A man can tell you how he feels. A man can cry. A man can shed tears, right? And still be a man because he has emotions and feelings, right? I have a therapist. I've been having a therapist for 10 years, right? It's taboo to have a therapist, especially as a Black man, because what do we need a therapist for, right? So like you said, like, I, I want to normalize somebody having someone to talk to where we keep it between us, you know, a, a, as long as it's not anything that's life-threatening or you're causing mm-hmm. uh, physical harm to yourself, but normalize having someone that you can talk to and, and someone that you can show your emotions to, or shoot, just show them to the world. It's okay. Mm-hmm. So like for me, mental health is, he and, and like, like, uh, Naomi Osaka, right? Some of these football players and now baseball players, like every baseball team has a person that they can, you know, that's in the clubhouse that they can go and talk to about things. And and guys are actually utilizing them and not feeling uh, mm-hmm. bad about utilizing them, which is great because the average fan, and I call them fanatics, and I go at it all day on social media with them because they don't understand, you know, the nuances of the game. And I learned from Dusty, sitting with Dusty for two years on the bench mm. in Washington was the best thing that could happen to me mm. because Dusty deals with each individual different, but mm. Dusty wants to know what makes them tick mentally because mm. if he gets them uh, mentally, they'll go out and, and produce physically. Mm. So getting to know someone uh, uh, mentally uh, and personally, like how's your family? How are you doing? you know, are you okay? What do you need? Is there anything I can help you with? Is there anything I can cover for you to go take care of whatever you need to take care of? Like, I, I think that's huge. And Dusty gets, gets repeatedly hammered for being a player's coach, right? But he cares about his players. Mm -hmm. So like that, that should be standard (laughs) for organizations and for coaches to get to know their players uh, um, mentally so that they can go out and perform physically. Well, high school and college too, for that matter. Exactly. Exactly. Go, yeah. Brian, anything? Yeah, I just think that um, I agree with everything that Jock is saying. Um, you know, I think it's it's come to the forefront to where, you know, as a man, you're not necessarily supposed to be in touch with your feelings. And it's it's about growth it's about knowing who you are it's it's like like my man freddie freeman right he's bawling his eyes out in the in the in in his press conference right and and back in the day you look at that it's like oh that dude's soft he's weak he's this he's that it's like no i mean it it's like me knowing freddie and being good friends with freddie i'm like that's freddie and 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 i and in all actuality I'm sure there's a lot of people that wish they could be that in tune with who they are and that secure with who they are that you're crying on national television Mm -hmm. in the middle of an interview. 
because there's a lot of people that'll sit here and that hold that back. Like to what Josh said, you have to be able to unload all of this stuff. They say, oh, they carry the weight of the team or the weight of this on their shoulders. Well, that stuff gets heavy, bro. <laughs> like, and sometimes you got to get, you got to get the weight off and being able to be able to have that release. I remember when Zach Grinke first came in the league and he was with Kansas City mm -hmm. and we had faced him and stuff. And then he was, I think, to my knowledge at that time, like he was one of the first players where they were like, okay, they gave Zach Grinke a mental break. I said, what the fuck is a mental break? Like, what is that? You know? And, you know, obviously he had his situation that was going on because, again, too, growing up, my my parents both grew up in Birmingham, Alabama during during segregation, civil rights, everything that was taking taking place, the civil rights movement, all that. So you had to grow up and be and be tough. But to what we're talking about, I get it. I understand, Zach. Because the game is heavy. Like when Jock's like, hey, I'm from Southern California and I go to uh, LSU and I get called the N-word for the first time. Yo, that's heavy. The first time, anytime, like, a black kid is called the N-word, like, that's heavy for the first time that you got to shoulder that kind of stuff. And you take it, but when you can have somebody or have some kind of form to be able to release and let that stuff go, I think it's huge. And I think all these teams, you know, have, like, mental coaches and, and everything to help keep the mindset right because especially playing baseball, it's a game of failure. Right. You know, and, 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 and you compound that to where there's a lot of things that are out of your control. Once the ball hits the bat, you can't control whether the guy dives and makes a play. You can't control whether, you know, you can't control what happens after it leaves, but then all of a sudden, Oh, you're, you're a bad player because as you're putting the bat on the ball, it's not, you're not getting hits. Right. You know? So it's, it's those types of things where, being able to have those types of releases to be able to talk and just get that kind of stuff off your chest because it's it's nothing that you're doing wrong. Like we can talk about the shift, right? Like they, I, I remember having a conversation with Barry, with Barry Bonds. And Barry told me, he's like, Ryan, if the second baseman's playing out where he's playing and you hit a hard line drive and he dives or he makes the play, what did you do wrong? Nothing. Exactly. Like all you're trying to do is basically you can't control what happens after you 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 hit the ball off the bat, you know. So I mean, I don't know. I think it's I think in terms of just the the the, the mental aspects of things in the game, but just let alone in life, man. Like you have to have these avenues to be able to release and just let go, and I think it helps you become a better version of yourself because it's easy for everybody else to tell you what to do or how to do it. Yeah. But they can't stand in your shoes and do it. All right. Hey, here's a bat. You go, you go up here and go face a hundred and you, you go hit it over there or you go do this. It's tough. It is, it is tough. And I think it does play a very, very huge and important part. And like I said, you see teams today that have these mental coaches for these guys to be able to go and bounce stuff off of and try to stay in the right, in the right mindset, because you just get hammered. You're getting hammered left and right. And you have to be able to like, let that stuff go or have that safe space to be able to let all that stuff just, just go. Yeah. It's really interesting. You mentioned the shift with uh, Barry Bonds who revolutionized the game in so many ways from the intentional walk to the shift Interestingly, they're going to eliminate the shift uh, going forward here in Major League Baseball, it looks like, with uh, a vote that's upcoming here. Powerful stuff. Bob, have you had anyone that you've ever interviewed that you just thought was uh, a little bit off in, in this space that we're talking about and you just pivoted in the middle of your interview and just said, hey, are you okay? You know, if there's anything I can do, let me know and just uh, completely abandon the interview. That'd be on the interview. Probably the closest thing to what you're saying is when uh, David Freeze was playing for Pittsburgh. He comes back to St. Louis, and uh, I'm doing a story with David, and he says, "Let's go to a, a private room," and he starts talking about mental health, saying when he was uh, the World Series hero in 2011, one of the worst experiences of his life. He couldn't even get out of bed, 
he spent the whole winter unable to get out of bed or just see people. He felt miserable. So he got into uh, mental health and uh, mm-hmm. you know, nobody would have known it. As Ryan knows, he was a hometown hero in St. Louis and everything else. But a, uh, it was you know rough on him until he finally got, got some help. I appreciate you guys speaking on this stuff. I want to get to the rapid fire because that's the fun part of the show. So any, anyone of you guys want to answer? I mean, Bob's already answered some of these questions, and I already know how he feels about the first question. Uh, okay, so Ryan, here we go. Uh, should Pete Rose be in the Hall of Fame? Yes. Jock. Would you like me to elaborate or just are we just you can it? elaborate? I'll just be quick and honest with you. Like Go ahead. let's be honest. Pete was never gonna make it as a manager. <laughs> but what he did as a player, right? What he did as a player, I mean, he's he, his numbers speak for for a Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'll say all I say about <clears throat> Pete Rose is forty four hundred hits. Uh okay, Bob, you want to share with them your answer to that and uh your philosophy on the pre-steroid uh post-steroid um belief on people that should be in the hall of fame yeah and pete rose i don't think he should get in just because every sign in the clubhouse particularly back in the day no gambling no gambling nothing about you know no steroid use or anything like that i do believe that rose gets in but after he's dead i just don't think they want to take the risk of him embarrassing anybody uh you know he said a few things a couple of weeks ago in Philadelphia, you know, that made headlines. So I don't think they were any part of that. Yeah. Uh, steroid era, yeah. and I vote for Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens every year first ballot. You know, Bonds, I think, you know, argues the greatest player who ever lived. Clemens was unbelievable. There was no rules back then. It was like driving on the freeway. If there's no speed limit at 65 or you don't have to be a cops around, you have to go 65. You go as fast as you can. Right. And, uh, you know, if there's no, you know, ever even back in the day when there's, uh, you know, a teacher was out, you had a substitute, you're clowning around, cheating off people's tests, you do whatever you want. Right. But, uh, but so I, my demarcation line is uh, in 2004, 2005, once they start testing, all the rules are in place. So I voted for Bonds and Clemens every year. I still hope they get in. Uh, and I vote for Sosa every year too. I won't vote for Alex Rodriguez. Uh, he used to spend an entire year, hurt his team. Manny was popped three times. Uh, Robinson Cano, go on and on. I mean, Bonds and Clemens, all they did was help their teams. Uh, you hurt your team and you're suspended half a season. Right, right. All right. <laughs> I love it. Uh, <clears throat> did e- either of you guys ever get great advice from a fan during a game and you're like, oh, shit, damn. <laughs> I mean, uh, other than don't swing at that pitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. Um, no, I can't. Uh, not that I can really. Not off the top of my head. No, not, not that I can really. Either. What yeah. was the best one liner a fan ever had? <clears throat> I'd have to go back to AAA. There was a guy <laughs> who was playing in uh, Ottawa. And actually, Jock, it would, you remember the time where. Uh, the Mets were playing the the Expos in Montreal and there was, it was like on ESPN or whatever. And there was like this fan that was sitting behind the on deck circle of the Mets and he was heckling Mike Cameron Uh the entire time. I remember that. And Mike was like, yo, if I hit a Homer, you got to leave or whatever. And Mike hit a Homer and the guy was like, no, it's supposed to be two homers or something like that. And Mike went up and hit another Homer. Yeah. so it was the same guy <laughs> at my AAA game in Ottawa, and uh-huh. he was heckling me. And it was this group of, like, college kids, man, that was all over me. He was like, <laughs> seven years, Howard. Seven years. I talked to Ed Wade. He said, seven years before you get to the big leagues, Howard. What do you think about that, Howard? And he had the accent going, and he was just all – and I had to give him I had to give him his praise. Sometimes when you got good hecklers, like, you don't even understand it until you get on the bus and you're on the way to the next city. And you're like, yo, that dude was living in my head. So it was like – it. but sometimes you got you to gotta have fun with those guys as, as well. And that's hilarious. I, I think it was uh, – mine was <clears> – <throat> I was in uh, Tampa – uh, and I was in A ball, um, St. Petersburg. I think they have a stadium out there. And I was hitting probably like, oh, something. And the guy was like, Jones, I got more change in my pocket than you. <laughs> <laughs> I 
you did your batting average. And I was like, I mean, I can't. I can't you can't that. say anything. You can't yeah. say anything. <laughs> I'll never forget that one. <laughs> You're like, you've been practicing that. <laughs> He's been yeah. sitting on that one for a while. Yeah. Oh, man. That's hilarious. Bob, you heard any great one-liners? <laughs> I haven't. I, I have not. Get all kinds of stuff on uh, social media, emails, right. that kind of stuff. Sometimes I'll, some guys will come up with some good story ideas. Like, hey, I didn't thought of that. So, but nothing jumps to my mind. So, Orion, you were one of the most feared hitters uh, during, you know, your best years in the history of baseball. Um, how would you describe your career in three words? Um, I would say, man, that's a good one. Um, fun, underdog. I always felt like I was the underdog, either coming through, getting drafted, um, the whole thing, because didn't get drafted out of high school. Um, when I got drafted, kind of fell in the draft the year I got drafted. And, and then it was kind of like my first year in Philly, so I think it was what Travis Lee, I think was the first baseman at that time in the big leagues because I was drafted in 01 and then they signed Tommy in 02. Mm -hmm. And so then I was just kind of like, wow, you know, like they signed Tommy, like mm -hmm. they must not, they, they don't know, but you know, it always, <laughs> it was always, but it was always something that I went back to that I had learned from my sophomore coach in high school where, cause I had gotten, you know, sent down from the varsity team my sophomore year. Mm -hmm. and, and to the sophomore team. And he said, he's like, hey, man, I know you're upset. And, you know, you can either sing your shoulda, coulda, wouldas or focus on what you need to do to get back up there. And he was just like straight up. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you're right. So I put my focus into where my focus needed to be and got back up to varsity that same year. So it was a kind of a similar situation with the Phillies to where it was like, all right, cool. Like you signed Jim Tomei. Awesome. Like, that's not going to stop me from getting to where it is that I want to be. So I knew I wasn't going to be rushed. So I'm like, let me do my thing and basically force your hand. Like, either you're going to have to bring me up or trade me. And then obviously took advantage of my opportunity when I got it. And it was like, I didn't know of too many teams that had sent guys that won rookie of the year back down to AAA the next year. So... <laughs> <laughs> but but it, but I think that's one of those things in today's game is where guys feel like it's supposed to be handed to them and if nothing was handed, you know, like, and I love Tone because he was nothing but, but great. He's one of the greatest people you'll ever meet, one of the most genuine, kindest people you'll ever meet. Hmm. And it's like I had to try to sit here and, like, knock off a first ballot 600-plus home run Hall of Famer to get an opportunity, like, when he got hurt. So, I mean, I think for, for me, it was just, you know, it was, it was fun. Um, I kind of felt like the underdog, but just like, and it was gratifying. It was gratifying. I mean, because I knew what I was capable of doing and, and went out there and did it. And, uh, you know, fortunately was able to, to, to achieve a lot of things early and had my injury and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it was, it was great. It was a great run. By you, Jack, 10 year vet. Um, Kind of twofold. Uh, the first three words that come to mind was not long enough. Um, and I say that just because like people always ask me, hey, what happened? Uh, the And they'll look at my baseball card and be like, what happened? Because the last two years, two full years, I played in the big league, like 285. Next year, I get six weeks to play in the big league and I don't play in the big leagues again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like not long enough, right? But then on the other side of the coin, it was fulfilling and it was gratifying and I felt accomplished mm -hmm. because I played in the steroids era, right? And I'm proud of my numbers because I was clean. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like I competed against guys who were on a different playing field that I was on, but like... I succeeded and, and and like Ryan, right? I didn't get anything handed to me. Um, like I got I got dropped into a good situation in Minnesota, but at that time, like we had to play at least one year at every every level and dominate at every level. Like mm. these guys these days hit 240 and they get pushed. They hit 230 and they get pushed. They hit 200 in the big leagues with some home runs and they get, you know, a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. like we we <laughs> 
I got sent out of the league hitting 285. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, on, on one hand, not long enough. And on the other hand, hey, I was proud of what I did in the, in the, in the area, in the era in which I played. Yeah, Kenny talked about that also when he came on the show uh, about how he was competing and did what he did with those numbers. Right. Should be a Hall of Famer. Yeah. In my, in my sure. opinion. For yeah. sure. And, and and not to knock Tim Raines, uh, but if Tim Raines is in a Hall of Fame, Kenny's numbers are right. a bit as good as Tim Raines. Mm-hmm. And in the same in the same position in the batting order and in the in the field. Ken, Kenny's the only person I know to ever bunt with a leg kick. <laughs> and put it and put it where he wants it to go like kenny kenny's butt game was the best like some of the best i'd ever seen that's awesome bob you have any uh words uh that you would describe these two amazing players i just authentic uh both guys mm-hmm. very very real uh i know jack you know ben ryan from uh living minnesota for uh a number of years so when Jock talks about the group of guys, I mean, those guys are great, close-knit, fun-loving guys, you know, with him and uh, LaTroy and, and Tori and Eddie, Matt Lon. So learned something everywhere I went. I mean, from, you know, starting off covering the Royals, uh, how McCray was a guy. You know, he taught me, him and Frank White, everything about baseball. You know, go to San Diego. You know, it, it's uh, Tony Gwynn and, uh, and the great players that went through there. Uh, you know, the Angels, you know, with, with Sam and Snow, then the Dodgers, you know, Piazza and those guys, you know, then go to, you know, Minnesota and, and be around. But yeah, just kind of a knowledge, you know, getting to know things. But both those guys you have on, on the show, uh, same with Kenny, very, very authentic. I'd say that you're in that category as well, Bob. Uh, okay, let's crank these last ones out here real quick. All right, uh, Ryan, Aaron Judge or... Uh, Shohei Otani. I mean, that's not even, man. Dude. Um, <laughs> I'd say Aaron Judge, just because you you got an MVP and you've got a most outstanding player. I'd probably have to say Otani is definitely going to be the most outstanding player because the Angels are probably not going to make the playoffs. The Yankees are in the position to try to make the playoffs. So there's always that, that long standing debate yeah. of MVP or most outstanding player. But um, I probably have to say judge right now. Jock. Uh, Aaron judge. I mean, he's, he's basically keeping the Yankees <clears throat> afloat, you know, uh, Stan's been in and out of there. Uh, Gallo didn't really work out. Um, Rizzo's been in and out, but he's, just been the one main constant uh, over there, even with all the injuries to the staff, the pitching staff, he's been the one main constant guy over there. So I, I would, I would pick Aaron judge. What about you, Bob? I think judge should be unanimous. Really. Uh, you know, I don't know why it's even, uh, I don't think it should be even a debate is mm-hmm. most valuable player, not best player it was best player. We should have given to Barry Bonds every single year he played. He was mm-hmm. always the best player. So, you know, it's too bad for Otani he plays on a, a lousy team. Yeah. Uh, judge play a lousy team, you know, then you can, okay, pick your spots here, but Yankees aren't in first place without Aaron judge and on historic, on historic phase too. Right. All right. Uh, Verlander, Scherzer or Kershaw. Um, man, I would probably say, I mean, I've, I've faced of all of them. I probably, I've faced Scherzer the most. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's, is pick your poison. Um, I'd probably have to say Scherzer because I've, I've faced him the most. I mean, all three amazing competitors. Uh, like, none of them are going to back down from anybody. So, uh, but I'd, I'd have to say Scherzer. Interesting. You picked the righty. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd say Verlander, man. Man, what he's done after yeah. leaving Detroit. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. He he yeah. transitioned from a thrower to a pitcher. Man, yeah, with the same velocity. Yeah. Crazy. And, and then for him to go, you know, from from Detroit to Houston, and then go out with Tommy John, and then come back and being as dominant as he was when he. I mean, if if, if, Verl- if Verlander's with the team last year, they win the World Series. Yeah, Bob. 
Yeah, I'm a jock. I go Verlander too. I mean, it's stunning what he's doing. 39 years old, coming off Tommy John. Remember now, Verlander too has pitched his entire career in the American League with the DH. The other two guys right. tonight. So, Ryan, you've been to Eagle games, 76er games, and Flyer games. You've been to Flyer games? Uh, once. Yeah. Once. Once back in the day. So, what, 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 Tell, tell me about your experience with those three menus. <laughs> oh, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, it's all, it's all the same. Like they're all like the fans and everything are, are, are still the fans. Um, I mean, the Eagles, Eagles games, um, they're, they're all, everybody's, everybody's Philly fans. I've, I've been to some tailgates, the Eagles tailgates and <laughs> all that kind of stuff as well. So that's, that's always been, been uh fun and hectic at the same time but you know we try to get a little enjoyment have some people do some relay races or some dance fighting um you know dance contests or whatever so but i mean the, the atmospheres are always always great uh so you were on the entourage and the office which one was your favorite man um i think i get a lot more people coming up to me and saying that you're you know they knew me from the office uh, more so than than entourage um there was a whole stretch where i think there was like there was like a whole week or two weeks where i just ran into people who did they didn't know i played baseball they just knew me from the office <laughs> that's hilarious. like i went to like i went and got coffee i, I went to like starbucks and got coffee and like hey weren't, weren't you on the office <laughs> like yeah it's like that's oh, hilarious yeah, yeah so it's, it was it was fun so you you've been married a while. Uh, dishes, vacuuming, or laundry? Which would I rather do? Yeah. Or which? What do you prefer? I mean, I'd rather do dishes. <laughs> I'd rather do dishes. Wow. If, if I had to, if I if I had to choose, I'd rather do dishes. I mean, yeah, man. Just slap them, rinse them down, and put them in a dishwasher. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Laundry for me. Oh wow. Yeah, it's, va it's vac vacuuming for me. It, it doesn't seem like any of these is a win-win type. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the vacuuming because I like to see the lines, and there's something about the OCD part of that that makes me feel accomplished. I don't know. Yeah. Bob, what about you? Wait, go ahead, Jock. Michael, that's that's how I feel about laundry. Uh, just folding and therapeutic. Hanging. Yeah, yeah, because I'm so OCD that I have to have this the like my closet is color coordinated, so it's got to be. <laughs> I purple love it. and then like <laughs> nike and then lululemon and then like uh true relit like it's got to be and it's got to be brand and it's got to be color bob did you know that about jock i did i did not <laughs> <laughs> oh that is phenomenal stuff what's the success to your marriage ryan I'm always curious about that. um i mean i think the biggest thing is is communication i mean with anything um, it's, it's, it's being able to communicate and have that mutual respect for each other. Um, you know, again, running around with three kids under, under 10, the, the schedules can get hectic. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff on the plate, but being able to also make time for each other. Um, like I'm coming up on, this is, this will be 10 years in December. Wow. So, I mean, it, it feels like it's a lot longer, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, you know, it's, but, it, but again, it's just, you know, like my parents have been married for over. 50 years and so it's wow, you know you man. definitely got to have that communication um to 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 be able to make some things last and, and sustain all right last question so you get to choose if you could have any five baseball players at your dinner table or non-baseball players at your dinner table so first you have to choose if you want to have baseball players at your dinner table or non-baseball players but the, the only thing is you you can never have met them before oh man uh that might take a minute well you guys can throw them out i know bob's already answered this before when he's on the show but go ahead if any of you guys have any answers to either one of those baseball or non-baseball so i'll take uh i'll take hank aaron i'll take uh president obama mm. i'll take i take wilt chamberlain mm. <laughs> no one's ever said will chamberlain yet that would be all these interviews i'd take will chamberlain wow. uh, walter payton sweetness mm. and then i'd take any females yeah i was just getting ready to say um i'd probably take i guess it would be a toss-up between althea gibson mm. and serena williams 
Wow. Mm. I'll let Bill Russell definitely be at my table. Yeah. Ryan, anybody? Interesting. Interesting. I would I would take Obama. Mm. Um, Popular answer. I'd take, I'd take Muhammad Ali. Mm. Um, I'd probably have, I'd probably take uh, Beyonce. There you uh, go. Yeah, Beyonce, Jay-Z. I will not be at the dinner table, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Only, only yeah. people of color at these tables. Let me see. Let me Bob see. Will not no, be I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. It either be like can't be your wife, like, man. It'd be like either like like Kevin Hart or like Gary Owens. Well, well it go. can be Gary Owens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't be Gary Owens. No, it, it, they can't be dead or alive. I forgot to say that part. Yeah, but he said yeah. uh, he's got to be African American. No, it doesn't. I was, no, he said. He said. Oh, okay. I was just joking. I was just okay. joking. Okay. I was saying yeah. the way the way the things were going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, what about yeah. you? Share. And maybe you've had a change of heart recently since the last time I asked. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, baseball wise, you, you got to go Jackie Robinson one. Yeah. I'd be fascinating. Yeah, then but go you know, back in the day with a uh, a Babe Ruth. Uh, you know, I met. I've been around Bob Gibson. You know, Bob passed away, but love to have him at that table. Uh, you know, fascinating, fascinating guy. And uh, uh, Dusty Baker for sure. Hmm. And uh, trying to think of a uh, a fifth guy, maybe a uh, either not Willie Mays. Hmm. Definitely. Well, you guys have been amazing. Um, sorry about my ramp, but man, when oh, I get dude, the... I, I loved it. I loved <laughs> it was great. That was I great. Was the rant better or the transition? Both. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, the, the rant was great, but the transition was phenomenal. Oh, it was priceless. That was priceless. <laughs> it was a smooth segue. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm here to serve you guys. Is there anything else that you guys want to share with with the world? We've been in over 30 countries, and and uh, you know, I'm just here to to have some fun, but do anything I can to, you know, change some of these narratives. Um, but uh, truly, always humbled uh, to have the people that we've had on this show, and including you guys, Kenny. Um, but uh, the stage is yours. Yeah. No, Michael. Uh, we've probably had. Uh, two or three dealings with each other um <clears throat> and when I, I met you on the that forum that we had with the coaches and stuff around the county um and I, I know I've been telling you I wanted to get on and, and we've been you know not, not been able to connect but I I really really do appreciate the way you go hard for us um because not met very like you said you know we've gotten to the quarterback issue not very many people do but I appreciate that you do and, and you stick your neck out and you don't care about the backlash. And that's just, that's rare. So I appreciate you for uh, who you are and what you do for us. Can I jump in real quick to that point? I appreciate the, um, the kind words, Yeah. but when um, <clears throat> Doug Williams came on the show, uh -huh. first black quarterback in the history of the NFL to win a Super Bowl MVP, mm -hmm. for those of you that don't know that, he told me something that was interesting because I asked him some of these types of questions. He said, in a locker room, when you have someone who is an ally, in particular, a white ally, that is something that people of color in particular in this day and age will never forget that will transcend anything else, rings, championships, MVPs, anything else. And so um, I don't do it for any other reason except because I, a, I want to be an example to my daughter. It's the right thing to do. And um, I just think that I'm late to the game. I should have been doing this shit a long time ago. Yeah. And I sort of missed the boat on it. And that's why I think so many athletes should use their platforms to do it. What backlash you're going to get now? You're more encouraged to speak out now more than ever. Like, how hard is it now? Like, there's you mentioned Muhammad Ali and everybody else. <laughs> they already laid the foundation, and Mahmoud Abdul Rauf and the and and all the people that have lost their livelihoods because they spoke mm -hmm. out. Well, it's right. it's it, it's, and I'm not to cut you guys, but it's still hard, man, because like they didn't have social media back in the day, right? So they it would have been a lot more easier back then, but now. People feel so empowered. They feel so strong mm -hmm. behind the screen that they can say and do whatever they want. <laughs> and then not only that, right? Now we have people going out and actively killing people 
because they don't like, you know, that you're from a different race. So you got to be really careful these days about <laughs> who you support and how you support them. And it's sad. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ryan. It is sad. No, I think, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such a messed up state um, that we're in um, at this, at this day and age, you know, again, we had civil rights movements, you know, not, not too, not too, too incredibly long ago. And it's kind of like, your parents we're still we're still in the same you know a lot of the same stuff is still going on yeah. um but i mean again i echo the praises to you mike in terms of creating and using your platform to try to help create and spread awareness because again that's what it's going to take and for those that want to learn and want to listen like you 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 take that in and then you try to help them learn and listen those who don't like there's nothing at this point you can really try to do except when or if they're ever ready to want to do that is when and if they're ever ready to want to do that. Bob? No, I echo uh, Simmons of both. Uh, I mean, you create awareness where people don't want to do it. Uh, like Jack says, I, it might be tougher now to speak out than ever before because of social media. I mean, I get all kinds of threats. People find out where you live and that sort of thing. Try to keep things as private as possible. Because there's a lot of a uh, you know anger out there and just deranged people, yeah. you know. And I uh, you know it's like people don't want to think that there's still racism going on. They think, okay, Barack Obama, racism's over because there's a black president. Yeah. Uh, Trump's elected. Okay, now it's wide open again. So it still goes on. It's just a uh, hidden much more, hidden much more than it was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, now, you know, you don't know what's going on behind closed nah, doors or who, or who thinks what. It's tougher than ever. No, nah, it's, 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 it's out there now. In broad right. daylight. <laughs> it's like, it's, hey, it's like, it's like, I think it was Jalen Rose that said it. It's like, hey, if my neighbors are racist, I yeah. want to know my neighbors yes. are racist because then yeah. I know who I'm dealing with. And I'm, you know I'm, what I mean? So it's I'm, like, it's, it's, it's out there, I think, yes. now yeah. more so than than it's ever been since probably civil rights back in the day because yeah. you have people out here hooting and hollering and 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 doing doing what they're doing in broad daylight now and i i think i think trump's uh presidency brought brought it right back out to the forefront of course mm -hmm. they didn't have to hide it and i i laugh because now when i see an american flag on a a, a white person's vehicle or on their person or or it's flying somewhere I, that lets me know all i need to know <laughs> and it's they, they it was a it was the maga flags and it was you know the trump flags but now it's american flags and it's like when i see that i'm like okay <laughs> that sums it up yeah yeah i mean it's like i think it was you jack that said the uh thank god for camera phones now and videos i mean yeah if it wasn't for that, nobody would believe anything going on. No, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, you guys, anything I can do uh, in the mental health space, in the ally space, uh, baseball, uh, I know I don't have much pull, but someone told me that I'm a connector of a connector. So I put Kenny in touch with crypto people. I've a lot of people that have come on this show. I don't know why they've gotten some good jobs afterwards. So we got some good ass Jim Rome in the jungle. It's right here in the sports deli, baby. We got some good ass karma right here. Let's fucking go. <laughs> I love oh, man. It. I love it. But uh, much oh, love to you guys. Crazy. And uh, yeah, man, don't hesitate. Anything I can do, uh, I'm just here to serve. So I appreciate you guys very, very much, man. Awesome, Thanks for man. having us, man. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Rhino, good to see you, Bob. Good you to too. You too. All right, All right. Much love, guys. Have an Thank amazing you, day. All right. Talk hey, soon, man. All right, peace. All right. Thanks, All right. Bob. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Michael. I uh, appreciate you, bro. Yeah, yeah, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, stay in touch, man. Anything I can do. I, I will, and you do the same. Yeah, I will. Oh, okay. All right, man. All Peace. Right. Yeah. Bye. Oh, amazing stuff. Boy, that that uh, definitely went in a lot of different directions. Didn't ask some of my rapid fire questions. Uh, actually, didn't talk too much about Ryan's uh, baseball career, um, but. You guys can look up some of the things that uh, he did, especially during a six, six year, a sex, <laughs> during a, a six year stretch uh, where he was one of the most feared hitters 
in baseball and then he tore his Achilles and uh, you know, that definitely impacted um, his ability to strike the ball in a way that he did uh, before that, but uh, definitely an amazing baseball player along with Jock Uh, Ryan had almost 400 home runs and just honored that they uh, joined me today. All of them. I invite a lot of people on different podcasts and the, the guys that I invited all came. Uh, which was uh, truly humbling and and speaks to the show, what we're trying to do. You don't have to agree with everything that we're saying, but I would challenge you to educate yourself on a lot of the topics that we're talking about, whether it's mental health or systemic racism or being a white ally, being more anti-racist uh, leadership, because uh, it's really about learning from one another and helping everyone be a better version of themselves. And you can push back, but um, don't cross those lines. All right, until next time, thanks so much for joining us. We hope we added value, a little inspiration, motivation, and education right here in the Sports Deli. Much love, everybody. All right, everyone, if you stuck around this long, we appreciate it so much, and here are today's outtakes. Doc, what's up, man? Michael, Bob, what's up? Rhino. Hey, Jack. Young Jock, what's up, man? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I had to jump on this thing when he said he was interviewing you, man. I so it would be good to catch up. There he is. Hey, Michael. Say, say deja vu all over again here <laughs> in the memorabilia room. I'm sending Jack Jones a uh, another link here. He's leaving the gym. Okay. So he's gonna pop on in a little while here. All right. I'm gonna let Ryan in here in a second. How's everything? Stretch run, huh? Yeah, stretch run. Padres hanging on for dear life. Jeez. <laughs> what what a what a season. Wow. The dog days for sure. Yeah. They should make they should make it now if Milwaukee fall apart. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. When uh when I'm done with the intro, anytime you want to jump in or you got to jump off, you know, do whatever you got to do. Appreciate you uh popping in. It's uh, always an honor. Yeah, no, anytime. Hey, hey what's bro? up, guys? Can you hear me? Yep, definitely. B night. Hey, what's up, man? They just you let everybody to. in these podcasts. What's going on, bro? Exactly. Oh man, you look good, bro. What's going on? We just got the chains, got a little chest showing. What do we go? Oh, <laughs> He's sticking his chest out. We got yeah, that I got a little chest. I like it. I like it, man. You look great. Look good to see you. Everything going good. How All you been? Right. Man, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Just down here. Chasing after these kids, man. Just living the dream. Right. Man, that's awesome. Well, we appreciate you uh, joining us. I uh, may have a couple of other surprises for you. I always like to, uh, to have people pop on just to say hello and show love uh, as I'm here to serve. That's, that's, I like what I, that's what I love to do. So, um, you know, we, we know your time is valuable. And um, I always do a formal intro. Today, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Boy, that was phenomenal. Great job and much love to everyone. Remember, Black Lives Matter. Stop the bullying. Stop the Asian hate. Contact your local and state politicians for any inequalities for any individual or any group that's being marginalized. Also, everyone, we want to raise awareness for those individuals that are currently imprisoned for nonviolent offenses, in particular those with long-term sentences that are disproportionate in particular to those people in the black and brown community. And I wanna send a shout out to 40tons.co. 40tons is a socially conscious cannabis brand and they're a social enterprise using the regulated cannabis industry to fight injustice, in particular for cannabis prisoners. So check them out again at 40, the number four, the number zero, tons, plural, 40tons.co, because what they're doing in the cannabis space and being a socially conscious company is truly incredible, and uh, they have my full support. And also wanted to remind all of you, if you're having a tough time, you can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And that number is 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-8255.
And now you can call 988. That's it. All you got to do is dial 988 from any phone. And they are available 24-7, 365 days a year. You can also always check me out on Twitter, Instagram, and on TikTok, at Mike Hootner. Thanks again to our amazing sponsors, Breaking Tea, Sport RX, PSK Collective, City Lokes, and Moolah Kicks, which you can see right here up on the screen. You can search them online at BreakingTea.com, SportRx.com, PSKCollective.com, MoolahKicks.com, and CityLokes.com. And if you'd like to support us at the Sports Deli, we'd love to have you either make a one-time donation or feel free to make a donation monthly, either $0.99 cents a month, $4.99 a month, or $9.99 a month. If you have uh, questions about that, Send me an email again to thesportsdeli at gmail.com and I will send you the link on how you can do that. Uh, you can also find it at the bottom of every podcast on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts. A link at the bottom to support the show. Please check out our website at thesportsdelipodcast.com. Make sure that we continue the conversations with regards to three strikes and you're out and mandatory minimums, especially people that are in jail for nonviolent offenses. So those things need to change. And remember, gents and ladies, please remember to do your monthly self-breast examinations. And remember, guys, this afflicts about 1,500 men annually with about a third of those resulting in death. So we want to make sure that we do our monthly self-breast examinations, both men and women. And guys, remember to do your self-testicular examinations every month as well. Until next time, remember it takes a village. For Dr. J and Coach K, I'm Hootie Hoot. This has been a production of Hootie Hoot Productions. Thank you for joining us in the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. Remember it takes a village. Much love, everybody. Peace.